Uh, hello, everyone. I think it's uh, time. I think uh, we could get started. Yeah. First of all, th thanks for joining my talk. So, uh, my name is Kong Wang, and uh, I'm uh, from the System Technologies and Engineering team at Binance. So, uh, I'm a, a software engineer manager, but I still do a lot of uh, technical and also sometimes coding stuff as well. So for the topic today, so I do have a lot of contents because I know you know this is a very long uh, tutorial. So today I'm going to talk about uh, pretty much focus on how to uh, develop a high performance networking application. So there are a lot of stuff here. So that's why you know this uh, session is pretty much a very long session. It will take more than uh, 90 minutes. So but uh, uh, we, we will get there. <laughs> Okay, so uh, briefly, uh, uh, let's take a brief look at uh, uh, the, uh, my talk today. So first of all, I'm going to uh, give uh, an overview of this session, and uh, then I will move on to the asynchronized socket API because I assume we are, are already familiar with you know the traditional or the uh, 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 basic socket APIs. And after that, I will move move the uh, topic to the kernel bypassing because you. If we are talking about high performance. It's almost impossible to, you know, uh, skip this uh, uh, kernel by bypassing. And uh, after that, I will also come back to the TCP protocol a little bit, and we will see what TCP has uh, developed over the recent years to improve the performance. And uh, starting from there, we will also look at some other protocols other than the TCP protocol uh, which we could potentially uh, explore in the data center and finally I will draw some uh, conclusions as well and uh, first thing first so uh, I make a lot of assumptions here because this is definitely not a beginner uh, session so I assume you all have a very basic uh, you know uh, networking technologies I assume you understand you know the very uh, basic net networking concept and I also assume you at least uh, uh, know what is uh, TCP IP stack and especially you know some of the basic uh, uh, TCP uh, uh, packet flow congestion control or uh, something like that and also I assume you at least know uh, the shock, what are the socket APIs are and I hope you could also ideally uh, uh, write some code uh, with socket APIs before and of course, because all of my code here is written in C, so I assume you also have knowledge about the C programming language itself as well. Okay, so uh, for the uh, how to use this tutorial, so because this tutorial is pretty long, and I do hope you will also get you know some uh, hands-on experience, you know, rather than just you know uh, 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 joining this talk. So I do have some instructions here. So I, the best way to learn is, I, I believe, is you know just to play with the code I provide here. And I put every code here together in a repo. And you can scan this QR code to get the link of this repo on GitHub. And if you have any questions, actually, I do have another suggestion. You could ask ChatGPT or uh, whatever your favorite AI. Because nowadays, they pretty much they are very helpful. They, most of the time, they are also very accurate, in my opinion. And of course, if they can answer your questions, you know, feel free to uh, reach out to me, and you have my email address in the front, uh, uh, in the beginning of the slides. And uh, of course, you can also ask questions in the net dev mailing list of the you know uh, Linux kernel networking developers. And uh, and also here, I want to uh, give some credit to my colleague Zijian. He's not here, but he put everything together, you know, in a repo. And uh, without him, I can't make this. Uh, Happen. And uh, let's take a look at uh, the topics today. I uh, mentioned we do have a lot of topics to uh, go over today. So the first thing is the first topic is related to the asynchronized socket APS. So uh, because Linux Linux operating in my opinion pretty much involves very fast. So that's why uh, even when I prepare this these slides, I even noticed the Linux kernel actually introduced quite some uh, fancy and also amazing uh, new 
APIs for the you know uh, uh, asynchronous uh, uh, I/O. Uh, 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 pretty much, you know, like the IOU and uh, also, uh, of course, Linux also introduced some other technologies like eBPF, XDP as well. So uh, just keep an uh, uh, open mind and, you know, Linux kernel operation is keep evolving. And uh, the next topic I would like to discuss is also related to the API, but also re uh, very uh, important to the performance as well, which is the TCP0 copy, because the networking developers actually uh, uh, put a, a lot of attention on optimizing the uh, 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 zero copy to uh, bring the TCP performance into uh, uh, optimal. And uh, then I will move on to the uh, another hot, hot topic, which is what we usually call it, kernel bypassing. Because for uh, uh, high performance, sometimes we do have to bypass the entire kernel to get the best performance. So this is why this topic is very, very uh, important. And uh, coming back to TCP a little bit after this topic, I will also go over some recent uh, TCP enhancement and development uh, 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 for the protocols to say what we uh, uh, what is new for the TCP protocol because TCP protocol is still very popular today you know after so many years and uh, lastly we will go over some other protocols other than TCP like uh, Homa Quick to see how they could uh, potentially uh, replace TCP in some scenarios as well. So this is pretty much the uh, uh, all the contents I have for the uh, for this session. I know it's a lot of topic, so that's why I will try my best to uh, go over them quickly. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to interrupt me because I, I'm, I'm not sure I still have time at the end of the session. Okay, so the first thing is uh, uh, we need to take a look at the traditional socket API. So the traditional socket API, uh, I assume you have some uh, uh, familiarity with the traditional socket API. Here, you know, because we don't have that much time, so I just want to uh, give a very quick overview of the traditional socket API. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, it looks like there is some... Uh rendering issue here. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So this is pretty much a very quick overview of the traditional socket API. So on the server side, you know, we have this, this kind of a traditional uh, listen, accept, uh, uh, send and receive uh, system calls. On the client side, pretty much uh, simplified with, you know, connect, send, receive. So this is a very quick overview of the traditional socket API. So, but today we are not talking about the traditional one. So we are talking about the uh, relatively uh, a newer uh, asynchronous socket API. So the traditional socket API pretty much the, by default they are blocking. So when we call the system call, you know, like accept, read, write on the socket, by default they are definitely blocking. They will block there until, you know, they have some progress, some data, some connection. So this is what uh, we usually call it a synchronous API. However, if you you uh, want to develop a high, uh, high performance application, I think you probably want the asynchronous API instead of the uh, synchronized one. So that's why I want to uh, talk about the asynchronous uh, APIs here. So we do have, uh, for Linux, we do have quite some uh, asynchronous APIs. Actually, pretty much like uh, three or four kind of uh, APIs. So we will see uh, this uh, 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 very soon. And uh, also on top of the system calls, so we could as actually also use some uh, other uh, USB libraries to uh, uh, use some other uh, you know paradigm to uh, uh, for our uh, development as well. So the inventor loop uh, paradigm is pretty much popular if you are. Uh, 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 dealing with the asynchronous APIs, you know, in the uh, in your application and uh, in a portable way. And uh, the reason why we care about the asynchronous API is not uh, is uh, 
uh, definitely, you know, for the performance, because we don't want, you know, just block the servers, you know, just waiting for the connection. We want the servers to have some other uh, 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 CPU cycles, you know, to uh, uh, work on some other stuff instead of, you know, just we uh, uh, sleeping here uh, waiting for the connection. And uh, of course, you know, when we uh, uh, nowadays we have our server have a very high capacity, so we need to deal with a lot of uh, parallel connections. So that's why the scalability also matters a lot here. So this is also why you know uh, the Linux kernel actually provide uh, some uh, better uh, asynchronous APIs than other operating system. So let's start from the very beginning. So uh, traditionally, we have this uh, system called the Select System Call. This one is pretty old, so I think it's pretty much available on uh, all the uh, Unix operating system. So however, there are some problems with this, this API. I think you probably already uh, are aware of the limitation of this API. So first, the first thing is, you know, the, uh, there is a limitation on the file descriptors because actually it uh, has a fixed size of a, a set of the file descriptors. So this set is pretty much, I think, uh, typically is uh, 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 1024. So, you know, uh, in our uh, uh, modern data center or in our modern uh, 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 servers, this is pretty small, right? So, uh, 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 because nowadays we, we could easily reach out to hundreds of thousands of connections on a single server very easily. And so this is definitely not sufficient. And there's another problem with this API is the scalability. So uh, because uh, this API needed to perform a linear scan across all the five descriptors within this uh, set. So this, this means you know, the performance is not uh, uh, very ideal because of this uh, uh, linear scan. And there's another uh, one last issue with this uh, API is this is API is a little bit uh, stateful. So it modifies the uh, file descriptor set, which is kind of, you know, introduced kind of some uh, uh, statefulness to this API. This is also, you know, very, not very convenient for the application to use. So that's why you know uh, uh, we have another asynchronized API, uh, uh, which is called Pool. So somehow, actually, this API actually kind of uh, uh, addressed the issues of the select system call, however, but not entirely. So the the uh, this this system call is no longer limited by the. Uh, the file distributor size anymore. So this is a very good thing. However, the scalability issue is kind of not uh, resolved because this API also accepts a array which actually is a description of the file descriptors. So it still performs kind of a linear scan of this uh, list of uh, file descriptor. So in terms of scalability, this one is still not uh, very ideal. So this is why uh, Linux actually provides another uh, set of system calls. So starting from this one, this one is called EPO. So this one is not no longer one single system call anymore because this one actually contains a set of system calls, pretty much three or uh, four system calls. So this is, we, we just, this is why I just uh, call this the EPO, uh, uh, pretty much a system call uh, a set of system call. So this one actually pretty much addressed all the issues with the uh, select and uh, pull system call. So uh, it uh, scales definitely very well. So you could actually operate on the EPO system call instead of, you know, uh, 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 at the runtime, instead of you know, uh, put everything together in a list or in an array or something uh, 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 similar. And this one actually also provides another advantage over the last two system calls I just mentioned is it could also uh, distinguish the edge trigger and the level trigger notification. So you could actually choose how to uh, uh, get the notification and distinguish these two different uh, uh, scenarios based on your uh, uh, use case. 
and uh, of course there is no longer the phi description, description limitation anymore. And uh, this one, in my opinion, is pretty much specific to Linux. So uh, maybe there are some other system, uh, operating systems also support this, but to my knowledge, it's pretty much uh, limited to uh, uh, Linux. So let's take a look at this, uh, uh, this system called Seth. So this one, uh, I list three system calls here. So they are you know, all uh, within this uh, set. So uh, uh, within this set, that means you need to uh, call them together. So it's no, they will no longer you know, work you know, uh, uh, alone. So you, we need to put them together to uh, use the, uh, 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 the equal uh, uh, functionality. So the first one is uh, uh, we need to create a EPOL instance, which is another file descriptor just for the EPOL. So after that, so the reason why we need that is we want to operate on this file descriptor. So that's why we have the second uh, system call here. So we want to add more, uh, you know, regular, or like for example, all the socket file descriptors into this uh, uh, EPOL. Uh, file descriptor, uh, or we could uh, do other, you know, uh, operations as well. You know, we could also remove remove file descriptor. We could also modify the file descriptors on top of this EPOL instance or you know EPOL file descriptor. And also, uh, uh, there are some other APIs. One of them is actually we could also choose to block on the uh, 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 connection or on the, the data. So this, this uh, uh, system can also provide a way to uh, uh, wait for the event if we want. So here actually I uh, provide a, uh, an example here. So uh, let me show this example really quickly. So here uh, I have I put everything together in the repo. So if you uh, check out the repo one here, so we could take a look. Uh, let me zoom into this. So uh, this one actually is uh, uh, I uh, I typically use the TCP server as an example because server is uh, uh, relatively uh, complex. Uh, uh, slightly complicated than client, but uh, still not, not that complex. And also, with the server, we could actually uh, learn about you know uh, the managing the connections and also the data for each connection. So that's why server is very very different from a client. So here, actually, you know, as you notice, that we can just call this the uh, epoch creates. Uh, create one uh, system call to create a file descriptor for EPOL. And after that, we will add our own file descriptors. Uh, in this case, which is a listening socket. So for listening socket, that means we are monitoring the connection themselves, not actually any data, just the, you know, the incoming connections. So this is why we need to have some kind of uh, loop. Actually, you know, for the uh, demo purpose, I just, you know, still use blocking uh, APIs here, you know, to wait for the incoming uh, connections. And uh, because this is server, so that means after we establish some connection, we need to have another uh, 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 epoch which should uh, 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 monitor all the data for each of the uh, uh, connection. So that's why you know here we have a nest uh, nested loop, and the inner loop actually is pretty much you know for uh, monitoring the uh, data for the new connection. So the outer loop is pretty much you know monitoring the incoming connection. So as you can see, actually this this uh, API is not that uh, complicated. So you know each each time when we have some new uh, uh, Connection. We just add the uh, file descriptor of this connection into the uh, uh, EPOL, and it will monitor, you know, the uh, data for each uh, uh, new connection. And of course, you know, when we uh, uh, need to process the data, we could still, you know, uh, uh, use the traditional uh, read or uh, receive system calls, you know, to uh, get the data from the socket. 
So let's go back to the presentation. So this is pretty much about the eco. So it's uh, it's a little bit complex, you know, compared with the select or pool, but uh, it's not yet that complex. <laughs> So, uh, so like I mentioned, in Evo space, you do have some other choices. So you don't have to actually, uh, you know, call this kind of, you know, complex, uh, uh, a little bit complex uh, EPO system calls directly. So for e in the Euro space, we do have another, you know, uh, uh, paradigm. So it's pretty much popular and it's called an uh, event loop. So this paradigm is pretty much, you know, we put every, all the events and uh, more importantly, we will also in, uh, install some event handler or callback to each of the event so that we could just uh, tell the event loop when you uh, get this event, just call my uh, callback to uh, process this event. So basically, this paradigm is pretty much about you know registering the callbacks and also you know add a bunch of the event into the event loop. And the event loop will, you know, once get a kick started, it will process all the loop and also it will call all of your uh, callbacks. So this is pretty much uh, a very popular paradigm for the uh, asynchronized uh, uh, I/O operation. So uh, in Euro space, we do have some uh, quite some choices. Here I just list one choice, but uh, just to let you know, we do have some other libraries uh, available as well. So I just really pick the label event here because I believe it's the uh, a very complete and a very comp uh, com comp uh, comprehensive. So uh, and uh, it, and more importantly, it's uh, very portable in my opinion. So because my talk is pretty much focused on Linux. However, you know, we do have some other operating systems. So for example, for uh, FreeBSD, we do, uh, I think FreeBSD definitely has something closer to EPO, but it's called KQ. So that's why, you know, this library actually uh, wraps up of this kind of sys operating system level APIs and provide some abstraction on top of this uh, operating system specific thing. So that's why, you know, the portability for uh, uh, this library is pretty nice, and uh, and it, it offers more than just you know the asynchronized I/O operation. Actually, it provides a lot of more than that. For example, it could also provide provide the operations on the uh, managing the timeout. It could also uh, provide the operation to uh, manage the buffers, the event priority stuff. So it's complex. So here I do have an example uh, for the uh, lab event as well. So let's come to the uh, code repo. Oh, let me uh, just use the link here. I think it's quicker. So yeah, this one is for the label event. So uh, like I mentioned, so for, if you want to play with uh, label event, pretty much everything you need to focus is on uh, is uh, uh, your callback. So you need to register some callback. You need to implement some callback. Actually, here in this example, the beginning of this code is pretty much the uh, callback. Actually, uh, there are two callbacks. Because I'm using a, a server as an example, so that's what, like I mentioned, we need to deal with two things. The first thing is we need to deal with the new connections. The second thing is we need to deal with the uh, incoming data for each of the connections. So that's why I have two callbacks here. So the first callback, you know, I use echo server. So pretty much, you know, we need to read some data and, you know, just send the same data back to the uh, client. So this is pretty much about, you know, this callback. So the second callback is, you know, to deal with the incoming uh, connection. So this time when we have accepted a new connection, we just add the new connection, uh, the file descriptor of this new connection to the event loop. Again, you know, pretty much it is handled like, you know, other uh, event as well. 
So uh, here we need to, uh, so in this callback, we also need to operate on the inventor itself. So we need to initialize the callback, you know, to for the incoming data, you know, for as a, uh, an echo server. And we also need to uh, set the callback to this inventor. And of course, we need to add this inventor itself to the inventor loop. So eventually, actually, uh, in the main function, uh, as you can see, in the uh, uh, bottom here. So we just need uh, everything we need here after, you know, we set up all the callbacks is just uh, kick starting the inventor loop. So, you know, we just call this uh, API to kick start the inventor loop. Because, you know, I don't want to bother the uh, many threading stuff. So here, I just want to use, you know, just one single thread. But uh, if you definitely, if you want uh, the uh, uh, many threading, you definitely want to move this out of the uh, main function. Okay, let's, come, let's continue with the slides here. So this is pretty much all about the uh, label event. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is, you know, something fancy and, you know, something new uh, to Linux kernel. So as you probably noticed in the uh, uh, newer Linux kernel, there is a very fancy thing called uh, IOU ring. So IOU ring is complicated, to be honest. IOU ring is pretty complicated. So, however, if we only look at the IOU ring from a very high level like this, actually it's not that complicated. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so it becomes complicated when we go, to, go, go into the details, but as long as we don't bother the details, I think we are uh, uh, still good with uh, the, uh, the overall uh, concept. So overall, IOU ring pretty much uh, uh, is uh, everything is related to two ring buffers here. So as I showed here, they, usually there are two ring buffers we use, you know, to, to uh, uh, for the IU ring system calls. So the 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 one we submit our request is called the submission queue. So queue here is pretty much you know a ring buffer, and the ring buffer for both for both of them they are shared between the kernel and the the user space, so they are shared memory. So it's not uh, uh, you. We could actually implement zero copy somehow, you know, with this kind of uh, ring buffer. But this is a complicated topic. And uh, there's another uh, ring buffer which actually uh, pretty much, you know, get all the completion uh, from the kernel. So, uh, you know, one, one side is for the submission, the other side is for the completion. So both sides actually, you know, the uh, US space needs to interact with the kernel space. So this is the overall uh, uh, architect of the uh, IOU ring. So IOU ring is uh, uh, relatively is new. So it's, uh, it's pretty much introduced in some recent kernel 5.1. So the reason why uh, Linux kernel introduces IOU ring is pretty much you know, to uh, get more uh, flexible asynchronized I.O. operation uh, uh, other than the epoch, because definitely Linux already have epoch for a very, uh, uh, for a rather long time, uh, longer than the IOU ring. But uh, uh, IOU ring is introduced definitely for a different and more uh, powerful uh, uh, purpose. And uh, in my opinion, the most powerful part about IOU ring, in my opinion, is the ability to chain all the operations together to reduce all the back and forth between you know, uh, kernel space and user space uh, uh, switches. So this is my opinion. And if we look at the IOU ring from this point of view, actually IOU ring is pretty much, in my opinion, uh, is a chain of the system call. Uh, without going back to the your space. So once we set up everything together and uh, put a, uh, and submit everything together to the kernel in a batch, so we will no longer need to come back to the your space until everything is done. So this is my uh, point of view. And uh, from this point of view, actually, 
you could uh, see RU is very flexible and very general purpose. It is not actually related to uh, storage or uh, 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 socket. So it's pretty much very general for all the uh, system calls, you know, uh, in, in, in some degree. Yeah, so um, RU system call actually is not, uh, uh, RU is also a set of system calls, pretty much like the uh, EPOS system call. So it's not definitely one single system call anymore. And uh, uh, actually from the very high level, RU uh, does not actually introduce that many system calls compared with X. Uh, it's complex city. I think this number of system calls is relatively uh, very small. So there are three core, uh, uh, pretty much three system calls here. Uh, you know, uh, for the uh, the entire I/O urine subsystem. So the first system call is pretty much uh, uh, set up everything, including the ring buffers I just mentioned. And uh, pretty much it will also, similarly to the EPOL system call, it will return another file descriptor which describes the IO ring itself. So after that, we will operate on the IO ring file descriptor. So that's why you know the second and the third of our uh, system calls, they will operate on the IO ring system calls. And also, the second uh, system call is very important. The IOU ring inter is pretty much the core part of the uh, system call set. So it supplements all the IO requests to the kernel, and it also provides a lot of uh, you know uh, different you know functionality, like waiting for the completion of the event. This is also possible. And uh, this is this system call is very very complex. If we want to go to into all the details because every request has its own format and every request has its own uh, argument uh, parameters. So if we want to go through the details, it's, I don't think one hour is sufficient to go over all the details. And uh, and the last simple call I want to mention is the IU register. So this is also important because if we want to deal with the uh, kind of uh, uh, the buffer, the IO buffer, the pooling, or maybe the uh, uh, zero copy, this SIM call is definitely very, very important. So with these three APIs, pretty much we could do everything, you know, uh, for the IO ring. However, like I mentioned, each of the system call is very complicated, and each of the requests and also the compilation is uh, very complex. So that's why actually we usually don't just use the uh, IOU ring directly. I don't think it's a good idea, you know, to get into every single detail, you know, to get uh, 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 your code correctly. So that's why, you know, the IOU ring uh, developers actually they provide a library on top of IOU ring, you know, to simplify everything. Uh, so you don't need to worry that much about you know uh, 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 which request has uh, what kind of format. So uh, this library wraps up all different kinds of uh, requests and you know this kind of uh, uh, different formats and provide a very uh, rich set of the libraries. So you can just call some uh, uh, library calls here without you know thinking uh, uh, digging into the documentation to figure out uh, hey what is the type of the request like what is the format of the request. So this, this, this uh, library is very convenient uh, to use. So I do have another example here. So we, maybe we could also take a look very quickly. So I you ring uh, the program here is pretty much also similar to the uh, label event, a little bit similar to the uh, label event. So, uh, uh, so uh, in the beginning, we need to do some uh, initialization. So to set up everything we need for the IOU ring. And uh, because we are using a, a server as, a, as an example, so here that's why I uh, you know, need to add a accept request you know, to the uh, IOU ring file descriptor. Descriptor. So here we definitely need to deal with the completion of the incoming request, you know, as a server. And after we 
uh, have an incoming request, we need to uh, check the event type here. So here we need to focus on the accept one. And uh, we have another function to handle all the uh, incoming connection and uh, processing all the incoming data for the uh, connection. So the add reader request is pretty much you know, a web of the uh, 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 read system call, but uh, with IOU ring. So as here, as you can see, how to how IOU ring wraps up the read system call, literally the read system call uh, with the IOU ring interface. And of course, here I use the uh, label uh, 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 urine. So you know everything is pretty much already simplified a lot here. So. Okay, let's go back to uh, this topic. So, and I do believe I mentioned uh, uh, zero copy because zero copy is also highly related to IU ring. So, and the zero copy actually is very, very important. So, if you talk with any networking people, they pretty much talk about, you know, zero, zero copy literally every day. So, why zero? So, why zero copy is so important for networking. So because you know, uh, uh, usually when we need to uh, transfer the data over networking, so usually the payload is definitely bigger than the header, but not always, right? So uh, usually, so if we really uh, need a copy, that means we need to copy literally the uh, payload whether from the uh, 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 US space to kernel space or whatever places. But as, uh, this kind of data copy definitely consumes uh, CPU cycle. So if we want uh, uh, high performance, definitely we want to reduce the number of copies. And another reason is, you know, when, uh, when we involve the uh, uh, data copy, you know, usually also uh, 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 consume the memory bandwidth as well. So if we, uh, our memory, memory bandwidth is also very valuable if we uh, want to uh, achieve the high uh, uh, performance. And of course, you know, uh, copying the data is definitely not that uh, uh, efficient, you know, compared with, you know, other, you know, uh, CPU instructions. So that's why, you know, it also brings some uh, 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 lat uh, latency if we want, uh, uh, if we really have, you know, the uh, data copies. And of course, you know, when we copy the data, usually it also uh, will also affect the CPU caches as well, which is yet another factor uh, which will affect the performance. So uh, when people are talking about the zero copy, but they, they usually don't directly tell you where are the data copies. Here, I just want to make things very, very clear. So where are the data copies you know, uh, in the networking stack? So when we talk about zero copy, what kind of copies we want to animate? So here is my uh, quick summary of the data copies. So the first thing, you know, especially you know when we uh, receive the data, you know, from the network interface to the uh, uh, TCP/SP stack. So there is uh, the first copy ha already happens when we uh, move the data, although without the involvement of CPU, you know, direct with the DMA. But it's still a copy because we call move the data without CPU from the NIC directly to the uh, RAM. But this is still a copy. And uh, and uh, if you uh, know a little bit of, about the linear kernel networking stack, you, I'm pretty sure you heard of the uh, socket buffer. So socket buffer is pretty much everything. Uh, related to networking. So it, it's a repetition of a package in, uh, for a Linux kernel. So this data structure actually is pretty complex. The layout is very, very complex. So here, I just want to give you a quick summary. Sometimes we need to copy the data because the data is not always linear. Sometimes we have the linear data just maybe for the header, and we, if we need to pull additional data, that means we need to uh, reconstruct the socket buffer in some way and move that data around, which is essentially not just a copy, but also another memory allocation as well. So this is also uh, very expensive, in my opinion, if we care about the performance. 
And of course, the another copy, I think people are already, many people are already aware of is, you know, the copy between your space and kernel space. So because, you know, the uh, uh, that uh, separation, we need to move the, uh, when we move the data across the uh, boundary, we need a copy. But that's just for the uh, simplicity. But not not strictly necessary. We will see how the Linux kernel try to uh, uh, manage this problem uh, very soon. And lastly, we uh, talk about the TCP. Actually, TCP has also has some uh, implement, uh, implications of the data copy, which is not very uh, 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 explicit. Is you know TCP requires you know uh, a transmission if you know uh, the data get lost. The, you know that, that means uh, when we send some data, that means we need to hold that buffer for some time until we get some acknowledgement from the remote. So this is another uh, implementation of the data copies, but this one is also so solvable. So we will see how Linux, Linux kernel try to uh, solve this. So, so talking about the TCP0 copy, actually there are quite some uh, uh, improvement over time, you know, uh, 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 to uh, improve this kind of uh, data copy for the uh, Linux TCP IP stack. Uh, the one thing I want to clarify is it's not always zero copy because in the past actually people just like, we do have some uh, ways to uh, reduce the copies but we we did not actually bring down the copies into uh, zero. So, uh, so that the reason I want to clarify this is, you know, uh, uh, if you notice, you know, the uh, technologies here, like, you know, uh, socket splicing actually is technically is not a zero copy. However, I just want to mention it here is people, uh, you know, just mention this as an effort to reduce the number of copies, you know, in terms of, you know, trying to uh, get the zero copy eventually. <laughs> So traditionally, we do have some uh, attempts to reduce the copy. Like I mentioned, you know, send fire is pretty much a very relatively old uh, system call. So there is a very typical use case, you know, when we try to uh, read some file, you know, from disk and directly transfer that as the contents of that file uh, over networking. So for this purpose, actually, uh, Linux have this particular system call just, you know, to splice the uh, file descriptor of the file with the uh, file descriptor of the socket. So two file descriptor get spliced together so the data is moved directly between these two uh, file descriptors. So this is how we reduce the uh, at least the two copies, you know, uh, and also, uh, you know, the uh, context switches between the kernel and the US base. And uh, there's another time to choose, you know, splice all the, uh, the, uh, the uh, file descriptor is called the splice system call. So this system call is a little bit complex because this one introduces uh, uh, an additional abstraction, which is a pipe. So the reason why it needs a pipe is uh, you can kind of think of this pipe as a, a ring buffer. So for ring buffer, you know, we have the producer, we have the consumer. So similarly for this actually for the pipe, we also have some producer and, you know, consumer. So that's why, you know, when we splice two file descriptors, we need to have one as a producer to produce data, the other one, you know, to consume the data. So this is how it works to splice two file descriptors together with a pipe in the middle. Yeah, it's kind of complicated, but uh, uh, relatively okay. And uh, speaking of this, actually, you know, with the recent uh, development of EBBF, I think uh, people do notice that we also have another socket splicing or socket redirection stuff called a socket map. So within socket map, when you when we add two sockets together into a, a, a socket map, we could actually route the uh, data within the uh, uh, socket map. Uh, 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 directly, so which is also kind of uh, uh, splicing and without going uh, back to the, uh, uh, coming back to the US space. 
However, I just want to mention, you know, all the three uh, 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 splicing technologies, they are not actually uh, zero copies. They just try to reduce copies, but not uh, uh, zero copy. So uh, in terms of zero copy, actually, the Linux kernel also has some uh, development over this uh, for this as well. So the socket API has also got involved on Linux, you know, to try to uh, uh, you know um, uh, achieve the uh, uh, zero copy. So on the transmission side, we have one additional new flag we could pass to the traditional uh, send message uh, system called the uh, uh, zero copy flag. This one, uh, one thing I just want to mention is this one is only for send messages. So we could not use this flag for the receive message because our receive side is complicated. And uh, it's actually it's much complicated than the uh, transmission side. So that's why you know the receive side is significantly different from the transmission side. So if we look at the uh, receive side, so actually the API is very different and is a little bit uh, weird in my opinion. So first of all, it uh, it does not use the traditional you know uh, read message anymore. So it uh, leverages a memory map. So because you know we use memory map to uh, establish the uh, US with you know memory mapping, and this is how it achieves the uh, how it avoids the data copy between a kernel space and a euro space, so it leverage memory map. And the memory map is pretty much you know, set up all the uh, memory uh, uh, for the uh, receiving. However, you know, uh, speaking of TCP, we sometimes we do we could get you know out of all the packages. So that means even if we want to receive a bunch of data, we may not get them in order. So what does this mean? That means even if we have a one chunk of the memory set up with memory map, we could not guarantee that we will get the data you know in the right order from the beginning until the end so that's why it provides another uh, system call which is weird which is uh, uh, get a uh, socket option to receive this kind of data within the memory mem memory map region we set up so pretty much we so uh, if we look at this in another uh, from another point of view this is pretty much you know we are memory we are managing the memory we set up with mem uh, 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 memory map so and uh, speaking of this flag, actually on the transmission side, this one is very, very uh, simple compared with the receiving side. So basically, literally, the, everything we need is uh, passing this flag directly to the send message system call. However, there is one uh, specific complication, complication is uh, the notification. Because when we uh, try to send something we, uh, over TCP, we need to, uh, the user service need to get notified, uh, hey, whether this data is successfully transmitted or it is still being held, you know, uh, waiting for an uh, acknowledgement from the remote. So that's why, you know, this notification is kind of uh, uh, necessary and also complicated. So for, uh, to receive the notifications, actually the kernel still leverages the receive message system call. However, it must be done uh, on the error, uh, uh, socket error queue, not the, uh, the socket receive queue, you know, uh, not the, uh, uh, the URL we use, you know, for the uh, receive uh, uh, message. Here, I do have some examples as well. So, uh, the, uh, like I mentioned, you know, the, uh, the send message side is pretty much uh, easy. So, we just pass this flag here to the uh, send, uh, send message system call. Oh, one thing I just uh, didn't mention is, you know, we also need to uh, enable this uh, zero copy feature with the uh, set, set circle option uh, system call. But this is a very uh, minor issue. And uh, on the receive side, uh, like I mentioned, the complicated part is about the notification. So, we need to retrieve the 
the notification with the receive message, but from the error queue. So this is how we call the receive message queue here uh, to retrieve all the notifications. And also, because the notification is not the traditional data, uh, not the regular data we have, you know, for the data, for the, you know, uh, uh, payload, it's just some uh, kind of metadata we want to get from the kernel. So that's why uh, we have to use the uh, kind of the control message for the uh, uh, receive message. So that's why this is another uh, complicated part. So for the receive side is is very very complicated. So I have to mention, you know, this is very very complicated. So that's why I don't even want to, uh, you know, write uh, the code from scratch because, uh, of course, I didn't have that much time. And fortunately, there is a very good example in the Linux kernel uh, 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 repo. So actually, uh, the Linux kernel developers provide uh, a self test, which pretty much could serve as an example, you know, how to use the uh, uh, TCP re uh, zero receive copy on the uh, receive side. So like I mentioned, uh, essentially we need uh, memory management here, you know, for the uh, t uh, TCP zero uh, copy uh, receive. And uh, speaking of the uh, zero copy, especially on the receive side, one thing I want to mention is uh, it's very complicated and it requires the whole stack to support a complete and a, a true zero copy. So uh, because like we, uh, uh, I mentioned, so from basically from the driver, from the kernel, from the socket API, from the application, everything along the stack, we need to be aware of the zero copy to make it uh, really, really uh, uh, happen. So, and speaking of the hardware side, this is the complex part. So, I just want to mention this here, just to let you know the, how complex this is and why it requires a whole stack effort, especially the hardware effort to support the truly uh, uh, zero copy. So, on the uh, hardware side, the network interface needs to ideally need to have this feature. You know, some dry, some uh, vendors they have some kind of uh, different form of this kind of support. But here, I just want to mention this. You know, very, very generally, without uh, being specific to any vendor. So the stability header feature is. Uh, uh, very important to uh, to support the zero copy. So the the uh, the hardware, the network card needs to separate the header from the payload. So the reason why we need this is the TCP IP stack itself. You know the kernel still uh, residence in the RAM, right? So the kernel is still in the RAM. So all the data, all the uh, code, especially the TCP IP code, we still need to process them in, uh, with CPU. So, you know, when we go over the TCP IP stack, that means the headers is still need to be processed with CPU. So that's, that's why, you know, that part need to be separated. And, uh, the, we, and uh, the benefits with separating out the header from the payload is the payload could actually to be left in the device until we really need the data into the, uh, for the TCPU, uh, for the CPU, because sometimes actually it's not the CPU which actually needs the data. For example, for machine learning, actually it's pretty much the GPU actually wants the data over the networking is not probably not the CPU. So in this case actually we probably don't even need to move the data out of the device. We could actually just uh, either let the uh, device let, let the data to stay in the device or we just use the peer to peer uh, uh, DMA or some other technologies to move the data between two, two different devices without bothering without bothering any of the CPU uh, cycles. So this is, this is why this is very very important you know for the uh, uh, zero copy. 
And uh, another thing actually is as long as we don't bother CPU, that means you know we could save a lot of uh, uh, CPU uh, uh, cycles, whether uh, moving the data or whether you know calculating other uh, uh, stuff like you know check some or do some uh, computation. You know we could offload to the GPU, right? So, and uh, of course, this one also requires driver support as well, because on the driver side, uh, it still needs to deal with the socket buffer. You know, everything in the Linux kernel is uh, the socket buffer. So that's why the driver also needs to uh, support this. And of course, eventually, when we, uh, the data moves into the socket API, the socket API also needs to kind of uh, changes to uh, uh, let the application know, hey, this data is maybe just in the device. You cannot just access the data directly like uh, as if they were in the uh, RAM. So uh, there are some other technologies I also need to mention, you know, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, for high performance uh, TCP. So recently, as you probably noticed in the uh, networking community, people actually are talking about the shared memory communication. So this is also very uh, good evolution of TCP. So the advantage of this actually is pretty much transparent. So it basically brings the TCP, uh, bring TCP together with RDMA without actually uh, 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 breaking the uh, uh, application compatibility. So this is also a, a very good technology recently developed uh, in the uh, Linux kernel community. And uh, because this one actually leverage RDMA, so actually it, it could also improve the TCP a lot as long as you know the hardware support RDMA, of course. So because of this, actually we could uh, literally get this for free. But there's there are some issue with this one as well. But uh, we, we we don't have much time to go over all the details. So briefly speaking, this one is pretty much you don't need that much. You pretty much you don't need any effort, you know, to uh, uh, gain all the benefits with you know the RDMA as long as your uh, network uh, hardware supports the RDMA. So I think now it's time to talk about the kernel bypassing. So I know this is a very big topic, and this is also a very uh, hot topic. So you, I'm pretty sure you uh, probably uh, noticed that there are a lot of uh, discussions related to this one. So there are also quite some technologies related to this topic. So I listed some of the, uh, in my opinion, kind of popular uh, technologies here, uh, DBDK, uh, RDMA, and we, I also listed some of the out of tree solutions, you know, like NetApp, like NetMap and uh, PF Ring. So they, they are not within the uh, Linux kernel upstream, uh, 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 they are not in the upstream. However, if you are interested, actually, they are also open source. So you, you can, you could also take a look if you are interested. But here, because I, I don't have that much time, so I will only go over the upstream solution, which will be uh, DBDK, RDMA, and the, the XDP stuff. So XDP is pretty much, you know, leveraging the EBPF technologies uh, in the kernel, but uh, uh, this one is very special because actually it also uh, bypassing the kernel in some uh, degree, so we will be there. So this is an overview of the kernel bypassing technologies. So uh, on the left side, I put the uh, 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 XDB socket and the packet socket on the left side. Just to let you know, they are not uh, one hundred percent, you know, bypassing the kernel because these are still within the kernel and they are still using the socket API. So that's why it's not one hundred percent bypassing. So on the right side, we do have the uh, almost 100% uh, bypassing the DBDK and RDMA. They just operate on the uh, driver. They interact with the driver directly. So that's why they com almost completely bypassing the kernel. So they are different. But I think, you know, overall, we could just uh, uh, call them, you know, kernel bypassing te technology. 
So RDMA is, I think, is uh, has a very long history, and you know we also use RDMA, you know, for machine learning. So this is definitely a very popular uh, protocol, and also networking infrastructure, you know, for uh, you know uh, for machine learning. So this one, this technology is very complex. So I don't even want to pretend I understand all the net, uh, RDMA stuff. So uh, as you can see uh, from this diagram, so it pretty much you know talks directly to the RDMA uh, network card. So that's what, that's how it completely bypasses the kernel. And uh, because of that, actually it also provides some library. And sometimes we call this a library, you know, call it, we usually call it verbs, you know, to uh, operate on the uh, uh, RDMA network interface. So and uh, pretty much similar, a little bit similar to the label event. It's also very, uh, uh, a very rich set of the uh, uh, APIs which provide a lot of different things, more than you know just the, uh, uh, the, the uh, networking. So it could also manage the uh, connection, manage the queues, manage kind of memory as well. So it's very, very complicated. Here, actually, I, oh, I do have some examples. However, the example is not from uh, me directly. It's, uh, I, uh, we found some very uh, nice examples on GitHub. So that's why we put it together within our repo so you, we, so you can find everything direct uh, 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 from our repo, you know, uh, 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 which uh, has a link to uh, you know, other uh, uh, code examples. So, so for RDMA, so another advantage is actually it could not only provide zero copy within a single server because it's a, a remote direct memory access. So that means even if we could uh, we uh, access we could ac also access the remote memory directly without uh, copying. So it goes even further than the traditional uh, uh, zero copy we are talking about here. So that's why RDME actually provides a very uh, uh, good performance, you know, because it writes to the re remote uh, memory directly. And uh, another technology we, uh, uh, which is kind of also popular is what we, uh, is DBDK. So DBDK bypasses the uh, kernel direct, directly. However, DBDK is, uh, does not actually uh, rely on any hardware, specific hardware support. So uh, it does not actually require the RDME support. So just a regular uh, 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 network card. So it uh, uh, talks directly to the NIC with uh, PCIe, and uh, on top of that, it also provides some similar set of the APIs for the uh, developers to use. So this API is also very complicated. So it's also it's another uh, risk set of the APIs. So it also needs to deal with a lot of different stuff, you know, like uh, memory pages, like memory pools, like uh, uh, memory buffers. So it also provides something similar to the socket buffer as we do in the Linux kernel. So that's why it becomes more and more complicated. And also because the network card actually becomes more and more complicated, Complicated. So the DBDK needs to deal with a lot of the, you know, the hardware spec thing, you know, like a crypto, like a compression stuff. So this kind of thing also becomes very, very uh, complicated. So uh, if you want to uh, take a look at the DBDK example, actually the uh, the um, DBDK uh, official repo provided some very good uh, uh, example uh, there. So there is a very uh, basic uh, forwarding prox uh, proxy written in DBDK. Uh, I put the link here, but I don't think we have that much time to go over all the details. So if you uh, are interested, you know, please take a look at the uh, code example in the official uh, 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 GitHub repo. So uh, DBDK offers a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, primitives, much more than you know just the the, uh, the networking, like uh, uh, memory allocation, huge page, and uh, uh, also. Okay. 
<laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, and another kernel by passing technology I want to mention is, uh, you know, related to the EPPF. So we have the XDP nowadays. So XDP is pretty much, you know, a very uh, special uh, uh, EPPF program. However, this program rather than to use a networking driver. So that's why we call it a, a XDP Express Data Pass because it's in the driver. So that means when we got a chance to talk with the networking driver directly. So this is how it bypasses the uh, TCP networking stack. However, because of uh, uh, the uh, XDB socket actually still, is still a socket family. So it still leverages uh, uh, all the Linux kernel socket APIs. So that's why it's, it, it also has a very thin layer uh, uh, to provide all the socket operation. However, down to that directly, it will just talk with the networking drivers directly with the help of the uh, XDP. So to use this one, we definitely need to write some EPPF program because it, it is the EPPF it is the EPPF program we load in the driver which will route all the data uh, which will redirect all the data from the uh, uh, hardware to our socket. So uh, XDB, so uh, so uh, XDB actually is very, also very special here because actually it also has a very uh, special shock, uh, special uh, maps for uh, uh, the EBBF. So it has a um, uh, XDB socket map, which could also uh, uh, redirect the packets pretty much in a similar way like uh, we mentioned uh, for the uh, socket map. And uh, it also uh, heavily relies on the uh, EBPF, so we need to write some EBPF program to process all the data, or at least uh, redirecting all the data. So on top of that, you know, we have some uh, uh, socket APIs. So, uh, and uh, now this is the complicated part. <laughs> so because we don't want uh, uh, copies, so that means we need to uh, deal with the zero copy again here, you know, with as the XDB socket. So this is how things becomes complicated when we uh, talk about the XDB. So this is also how the XDB uh, socket APIs becomes complicated, you know, compared with other uh, APIs. And of course, we also need to deal with the memory management stuff every single time when we need to deal with the zero copy, right? And of course, we also have uh, another ring buffer to talk about because it look, looks like everything related to the zero copy is pretty much related to the ring buffer, whether it's IOU ring, whether it's the uh, packet socket, or whether it's the XDB socket. Here we have another ring buffer. Yeah, I'm sorry, but uh, we do have another ring buffer here. So the complicated part is actually it has another layer on top of this ring buffer <laughs> again. So, so there is a Eurospace memory we need to allocate to manage all the data. And on top of that, actually we need to have some pointer to the, uh, this kind of memory chunks we need to divide within this memory region. And we need to use the ring buffer uh, for the XDB socket to manage this kind of memory chunks. I know this, this is very confusing, but uh, it is how it works. So with this kind of ring buffer, so the concept is also very similar, very close to the uh, LU ring. So we have a kind of a submission or you know the transmission. I think for the uh, XDP is called a uh, transmission and a receive. So for the LU ring is you know called a uh, submission and completion. So but the the idea is pretty much similar. So we uh, send send uh, data on one. Uh, ring buffer, you know, receive data on uh, the other ring buffer, but the operation is also kind of similar, yeah, and also complicated because of the uh, Eurospace memory we have to add on top of this uh, uh, ring buffer. So, uh, so I think it's time to come back to the TCP. And because it looks like we were talking about a lot about you know bypassing TCP, bypassing the Linux kernel. So actually, 
to be fair to TCP, I think it's also a very good opportunity to review what TCP has done recently, I mean, relatively recently, uh, over time to uh, improve the uh, TCP pro pro protocol performance. For example, the 3 way handshake is pretty much a, a, a performance issue if we want to deal with you know, the uh, 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 short connections because the time, the overhead we spend on the three-way handshake is not that affordable when we have the short connections. So TCP, for example, TCP faster open is pretty much a proposal and a protocol uh, change which actually try to uh, improve this kind of you know uh, uh, three-way uh, handshake connection. And of course, on the protocol level, we also have the uh, uh, ESN stuff as well, which could also help us to deal with the uh, congestion uh, uh, control of the uh, 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 TCP protocol. And uh, for the data center, we also have some other uh, congestion control algorithm, relatively new one, uh, provided uh, uh, specifically for the uh, data center and uh, using the uh, 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 ECN uh, signals I just mentioned. And also Google definitely also has some other uh, congestion uh, control algorithms, BBR, uh, which is also relatively uh, new uh, uh, for the uh, congestion control. And uh, for the TCP con uh, itself, actually, you know, there are some uh, concerns about, you know, the uh, 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 connections with data and say so TCP itself is also evolving to uh, address this uh, uh, issue so like uh, the multi-pass TCP is definitely a very good uh, uh, proposal to uh, uh, solve this kind of issue so TCP itself actually makes quite some uh, uh, progress to improve itself you know as a protocol and uh, the multi Parse TCP here, I just don't want to mention because it's yet another socket API. So this is why I just don't want to mention here, it here. But however, it's on top of the traditional uh, TCP socket, just, uh, uh, and, but, uh, but have another additional uh, protocol, kind of protocol on top of the uh, uh, traditional TCP one. So it's pretty much, uh, other than the protocol or the family, it's pretty much similar to TCP. And uh, there are also some other protocols we could actually uh, consider. So TCP is not everything. I know TCP is definitely the most uh, popular one, and it definitely has a lot of uh, um, uh, 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 attention and also a lot of uh, use cases, uh, very wide use cases uh, in different scenarios. And uh, just to be fair, I just want to mention there are some other choices we could consider, you know, depending on the user case. And uh, the first one actually is uh, nothing new. Actually, this protocol, the stream control transmission protocol is pretty, in my opinion, is kind of uh, old. So uh, it exists definitely for a long time. So the reason, in my opinion, why it's not popular is pretty much because it's not that compatible. So it's a new protocol and on the socket layer, there's a different uh, socket family of protocol and it also has some kind of uh, different uh, socket addresses. So that's, in my opinion, that's why, that's probably why it's not uh, that uh, widely used. And uh, also recently, we do have some other protocol available, especially on top of UDP, people also build some uh, other re reliable transmission protocols, which is called QUIC, the QUIC uh, UDP uh, internet connection. So 
it uh, builds everything on top of uh, UDP. So that means you know it uh, literally has uh, uh, the uh, retransmission, the uh, uh, congestion control uh, in the user space on the on top of the UDP. So this protocol is also get used in some scenario like you know the content uh, uh, delivery network, and we also use this on the on our edge network as well. And uh, the last one is maybe is not that popular is a uh, HOMA protocol. So it's in parallel with the uh, TCP protocol is on top of the IP protocol. However, this one actually, this protocol actually try to address quite some uh, uh, challenges within TCP. For example, uh, the most uh, important uh, uh, advantage of this protocol, in my opinion, is it provides a receiver-driven uh, congestion control, you know, compared with TCP, which is uh, pretty much the center-driven. So this is uh, significantly different. And this protocol is pretty much optimized and focused on the RPC uh, 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 communication. So that's why, you know, for the RPC communication within data center, this protocol actually performs uh, better than TCP. So we are also doing some optimizations with this uh, protocol and also we are trying to uh, uh, do some research and trying to make TCP as close to this protocol to gain all the advantages as well. So the STP protocol, like I mentioned, so it's pretty much a, a, a different socket API, at least for the uh, socket addresses. So, uh, so for uh, in terms of that, actually, you know, it's not that uh, easy. If we just want to port, you know, some traditional TCP application just to the uh, HTTP, you know, uh, 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 protocol. So that means we definitely need some effort to make this happen. And however, this protocol itself is definitely very interesting. So it provides, you know, some uh, a few advantages over TCP, like you know the uh, resilience. However, like I mentioned, TCP itself is also trying to address some of the challenges here. And another advantage actually is it also uh, solves the message boundary, which uh, is another uh, uh, drawback of the TCP. However, HOMA also try to solve this, you know, as I think, you know, uh, people will very easily notice this is definitely a problem for TCP. So TCP is a stream uh, 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 oriented uh, uh, protocol. So the message boundary is very important for the RPC protocols, but not necessarily for all the you know uh, uh, applications on top of the uh, TCP. So th there are definitely quite some effort you know try to address this. And even for TCP, there is also some uh, proposal with EBPF try to solve this as well. So. And the quick protocol, like I mentioned, is pretty much built on top of UDP. So what does this mean is, you know, pretty much everything is in the user space. So what does this mean is you probably don't want to bother uh, implementing the whole protocol from scratch by uh, on your own. So that's why, you know, there are some libraries, you know, to deal with this kind of uh, quick protocol. Uh, complexity and the library actually simplifies this a lot for the developers. Here I also have a, uh, some example. I think I use LQuick or some other uh, uh, library. So uh, here probably I don't have that uh, much time to go over all the details. However, if you are interested in this, oh sorry, oh, this this example is from the LQuick uh, repository. Yeah, so I think it also provides some echo server if I remember correctly, in this repo. So, you know, echo server is pretty much a very uh, good example if for you start to start with to learn all about the uh, uh, protocol stuff. And the uh, HOMA protocol. So HOMA protocol actually is uh, uh, very close to TCP uh, in terms of the API. So I think the API is not that uh, different. However, you know, because it also is also a different protocol, so that's why, you know, the API is not uh, fully compatible. 
So that's why, you know, when we, uh, if you want to consider HOMA, definitely the API is also a very serious consideration, especially if you don't want to, you know, rewrite everything uh, just for HOMA. However, you know, HOMA itself is definitely very promising, uh, per promising in my opinion. So especially my favorite part is the receiver-driven receiver -driven, uh, uh, congestion control. And uh, however, we, uh, I think TCP is also trying to uh, address this. And uh, another advantage of HOMA actually is it could also uh, uh, it could also take the queuing delay into the consideration because nowadays people are talking about the uh, queuing delay, the talking about the uh, active queuing management stuff. So this is also uh, become very important because we uh, need to deal with the TCP pacing, the TCP burst stuff, and uh, uh, that's pretty much, you know, uh, uh, in my opinion, if we could actually uh, kind of address this in the uh, protocol itself, it could also definitely benefit, you know, all the uh, uh, traffic burst, all the pacing uh, stuff. And uh, finally, I think finally we have uh, everything uh, uh, go over together. So I do have some quick uh, conclusions. So the first thing is I would like to uh, advise people to leverage the asynchronous socket API if you really care about the performance. And also I do uh, believe the TCP zero copy is very, very important if you are really care about you know, the TCP performance. And, uh, and of course, there are some other uh, solutions as well. If you want to, you know, completely bypass the kernel, we do have some op different options, you know, for you to uh, consider like a DBDK, RDMA, XDP, you know, depends on your uh, use case and, you know, your scenario. So different environment may, you may have to choose a different uh, 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 solution. And uh, finally, I just want to remind the people, uh, although TCP is pretty much literally uh, everything, however, there are also some other protocols of, uh, nowadays for, our, uh, for us to consider, you know, like a quick, like HOMA. Uh, they are pretty uh, uh, promising in my opinion. So if you, we keep up our mind open, I think, you know, there are some other choices uh, available than the TCB. So that's pretty much all I have for today. And I do appreciate your time here. I know it's a very long talk. <laughs>